I would like to welcome Reginald Eugene Williams to Video Oral History Project, Haight-Ashbury in the 60s. I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. It's nice to be here. I'd like to just give you a chronology of the Straits uh, art and uh, some movies and a chronology of all the events in the theater. Thank you so much. Including thank shows you. with the dead and Janice. Well, my name is Rebecca Nichols and I'll be moderating this event. Thank you very much. Let's start right from the beginning. Okay. Where were you born? I was born in San Mateo, California. Fifth generation Californian. My wow. family's uh, from Humboldt County. Wow. And uh, been in the Bay Area for a long time. I went to Burlingame High School and uh, College of San Mateo San and graduated San Francisco State with a BA in history. Wow. And what, what are your parents' names? Uh, my mom's name was Cynthia Edwards Williams. My dad was Kermit Lawrence Williams. And uh, would they, where were they? Were they were born in California? Yeah, my mom um, was the daughter of a, a wire rope manufacturer, a self-made millionaire in South San Francisco, wow. an industrial setting, and she came from a, a Humboldt County, from oh, wow. ranchers in Humboldt County that date back to the very first wow. people that went to that county. So if we went all the way back to fifth generation, where did the original, where where in, in the world did they come from before they immigrated <laughs> here, do you know? In a lot of ways, my mom was a, 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 a little nutty, and one of the ways was spending money on genealogy. And, you know, for every genealogist, you've got an opinion. And, of course, sure. we got Williams's, so that makes us related to William the Conqueror, or right. Kaiser Wilhelm, or... Any of the famous Edwardses, of course, that were pilgrims and, exactly. and uh, Puritans. So I, I couldn't give you a straight answer. But sure. Well, fifth generation, that's a lot. Yeah, I know where they were. They were uh, How rangers from Americans? North California, and yes. they're still there. Oh, they are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, so I am going to bring you, like a time capsule from your early birth, to the 60s. Great. Here in the Haight-Ashbury. Um, I would love you to think back your memories of the 60s, and let's start with its early beginnings. Okay. I have a chronology that I've worked into the straight.com, which is my website for uh, the straight on the hate, which is my manuscript. And basically, uh, you probably hear recurring themes about early roots in the 60s. Sure. Well, 1960 is when I graduated from high school. And then in junior college at San Mateo, uh, College of San Mateo, I was the Chief Justice of the Judicial Council for three years. And during that time, um, other people in, in that turned out to be in the Haight-Ashbury and in the scene later, like the bass player, Big Brother and the Holding Company, was Pete uh, Album. Peter Album, yes. And uh, he and I... and. Other people would, you know, collect behind uh, his house in a little shed and, and puff the uh, magic dragon. That's right. <laughs> and uh, one thing led to another, and he took me to where his, his brother, who was also a, a famous, more famous at that time than, than he was, but an established musician that unfortunately died too early, Rod, and he had, was managing 1090 Page at that time. Right. And so uh, that's where I met a lot of the people and ended up in uh, there was a scene kind of coagulating out of the folk scene, which we've been following since we were kids in sure. North Beach. Fox and the Hound, Coffee and Confusion, sure. Billy Great Roberts, and and, and, uh, yeah, the, the uh, yeah. Drinking Lord when it moved out to, exactly. to Union Street. There was a whole very strong uh, support group for uh, folk scene. Yeah. and stuff uh, that was pretty much going on in New York at that same time, but exactly. without the luminaries out here. Exactly. Out here we also had a kind of a, a, a beginning of, of a civil rights movement, and it, it coagulated around Cadillac Road downtown and uh, the rights of black workers, and was very early in the 60s. And, in 1962, I was at a, a church over here on the upper Fillmore and to hear Louis Lomax, who was an author, uh, a well-known black author at that time, telling people we ought to go to Washington, D.C. and support Martin Luther King. So I hitchhiked across the country wow. and that was 
in uh, August 23rd and a month around that, uh, six, uh, 63. And then when I came back and went back to being the uh, Chief Justice of the Judicial Council, and within a month or so, Kennedy was shot while we were at a, a, a conference at the Silomar for student leaders that were collected from the junior colleges that were from all over the state. So I remember exactly where I was when, when that happened and everybody broke into crime. Right. What are we going to do now? And basically, the um, effect it had was to make us more hardcore. It wasn't going to be a hep happily ever after kind of thing. The sure. forces of assassination were reaching in and would continue actually to pull down victims either by conspiracy or by some casual coincidence. But at that point, it really changed a lot of people's lives in terms of how we looked at authority and also this widening war that was happening at that time that was uh, pretty much fit right into what I was learning about uh, worldwide and U.S. imperialism in my graduate studies uh, seminars at San Francisco State. So it was easy to fall in line with the free speech movement over at Berkeley and hop on, you know, get over there for that. People's Park. Was at People's Park. Was there uh, when Kesey and the bus and all those people, uh, it was the first time I'd ever seen them, um, did uh, when we mobilized in Berkeley and marched on the Oakland uh, Depot and were turned around by the uh, Hells Angels. Um, but basically, there was a lot of people at that time that were coming together on both sides of uh, a lot of these questions, in civil rights and, and uh, the war. As it grew intense, the opposition grew more organized sure. and intense. And I had documents for, with my friend, uh, uh, I grew up with uh, a fistful of friends that lasted through high school and became more intense during college and after college. And actually, they were uh, the core of people that, that ended up running the straight theater. Um, also in 63, a little later on in the year, I, had, I wasn't going to San Francisco State at that time, but I went to San Francisco State with friends and sat in the aisle and heard Alfred and Leary talk for an hour about what they'd been doing or hours. And they had mentioned the idea of a sensorium or a place where you go when you're high in psychedelics, enjoy music, enjoy companies, relaxation, couches, no, not, you know, very non-threatening set and setting. It sure. was part of his set and setting theory. Sure. And it stuck in my mind, you know, so when, um, the the whole thing kind of blossomed for one reason or another with the mime troops arrest in the park and you try and get the toothpaste back in the tube and all of a sudden you develop a genre I'd never seen before uh, where the music and the people dancing and the lights and everything became one thing and, and it was uh, a new way of life. It really seemed to us at that point that didn't matter what was going on out there, uh, we would just do our thing and, and we would eventually end up with legalized pot, you know, and sure. people would Peace dress like earth. we do. And <laughs> you look around and we really invented a lot of the styles that we usurped by uh, Madison Avenue and other places sure. where they left the content on the floor, the civil rights aspect, the anti-war protest, and, uh, and, and kept the sideburns for a while, like the puffy shirts, the bell bottoms, the style, and even a lot of the lingo. So um, I, uh, we were really there everywhere you looked in San Francisco <coughs> State on the street. I, I described, and if I was going to read anything, I, I described that when I found the street theater chapter, which is basically a walk down 8th Street. I'd love to hear about it. In that time, it, uh, it's uh, the next chapter to go online. But basically, the point was at that point, the film war was kind of spreading out. The, the uh, people that lived in, in this area were basically, except for students from UC, 
they were Eastern European families, and uh, Hiroshima Palace up there was was uh, one of the main centers sure. that that kids would go to get uh, fifty cent Hiroshkis and pockets of meat, and so we could leave very cheaply back then. You buy pork chop for twenty five cents. So there was a lot of things that 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 made it easy for younger people to say, I'm just going to live the way I want to live. So where do you live? And, and North Beach had skyrocketed. Uh, sure. the troop. And so as the mine troop thing developed, the very first time I went there into the Fillmore was to make sure I did, because I had gone down to the warehouse and there was a line around the block and I couldn't get into the first mine troop benefit. I heard about it too late. So the second one, which was at the Fillmore, Bill had found the Fillmore in the mm -hmm. 1930s dance hall, 150 a week, and, and rented it, and they were doing the benefit. And it went up about four in the afternoon, and who should uh, come face to face but Bill Graham, and he's going, well, you can't come in here. <laughs> and so uh, he did his Bill Graham thing, and I turned around and left. But I made it back that night, and I witnessed the whole thing, and basically the Trips Festival, I went every single night to, and I had a lot of my ideas from what light shows should be from watching them, and I was inspired to do that myself. And coincidentally, one of my old friends who was in the theater and also went to grammar school with me, uh, Luther Green, introduced me to Bill Graham um, as he was introducing me to Tony Martin, who was his friend and an artist at Mills College who had been the one settled in on to do the lights at the film. And just like Don Bukla did the sound effects, Tony Martin did the lights. And at the beginning, at this point, it was very exciting for him. And, and sure. with a wife and young baby and Bill deciding after a few months that, you know, you don't need to give that much money to the light show. You've got to give it to the band. So, he started strangling the light show wages, so Tony just started treating it like uh, eat lunch at the job. So he'd sit there and eat his bag lunch while us while rock and roll music was going on. And he's much more of an artist, like a lot of the people Bill Hammond included are that ended up doing lights. But sure. I basically would get psychedelicized and like the movement. I like uh, the uh, the color flowing around, my, and very soon I demonstrated a talent with being able to make patterns like fire dance or molecules rush or whatever it was that would keep track uh, time with the bands. Sure. And Ron Pulte, the night of uh, so Saturday night, he was the manager of Quicksilver, and they were playing with uh, Paul Butterfield, mm -hmm. which would make that about March 31st, the end of March, beginning of May, uh, April at the Fillmore when they brought them in from out of town. And by that time, Tony was just not interested. He let me just step right down front and just walk out. And I demonstrated that light is faster than sound. With <laughs> five or six plates, I could have a sound and a shape and a movement for you every person. You did five, person. six plates at once? Oh, yeah. I do and three, and I think it's a lot. But five, six? Yeah, I Double do. Double-handed. Yeah, both, both sides. Amazing. And, um, as a result, Ron Pulte liked what I did, and he had just gotten a, a more and more offers from promoters and I'm other sure. people booking events up and down the coast. So sure. he said, we're going to take a light show with us. So I ended up doing events in Hayward or Berkeley. Or, did they have or Clover Hall. opening for them in those days? Clover? Um, I remember Clover was coming along a little later. Okay, so but this is basically way early we then. did. I uh, did San Jose with them and Merced, and and it was great going out on the road doing lights for the Grateful Dead and all Amazing. of them. Yeah. But that happened uh, then that that week, and then um, at the the very next week I was walking down Hay Street and okay. seeing this the the blend of. Uh, people that um, lived in the neighborhood at that time, and it was uh, well, easily 60% boarded uh, up windows. Both. We're, we're talking 65, 66, somewhere in there? Yeah, exactly. In 65, it probably reached the bottom. It was all vacant uh, boards, broken glass, plywood over the windows, all the storefronts covered up. Right. And then slowly, in, in the end of 65, about the same time, you know, blossoming and, and 
along the way, um, one by one, the stores would start uh, being rented. Alan and, right. and the people uh, that he was with were above the psychedelic shop there. And the Oracle. Five movies. Yeah, movies and psychedelic shop and all those people. And sure. Basically, it seemed at that time that we were, that, that there was an idea of community sort of gathered uh, momentum. And uh, very soon we were the, I walked down the street and I just saw this amazing building on the corner in 1912. It was built, as it turned out, vaudeville theater. So the acoustics in it are perfect. They're 1500 capacity, they're balcony with um, about 40 rows of seats up from the stage to the underneath the balcony. And the acoustics were perfect and uh, the lights were shut off and, and, and I, I saw the note saying go to the hardware store, I went to the hardware store, got the key and, and went around in there with a borrowed search uh, flashlight and the mold had taken over and it was underwater and a lot of the stuff had uh, deteriorated. But as it turned out, the, the electricity had been gutted out of the building for its copper content. There, there were two previous uh, tenants in the 60s in the theater itself. And one was an Abyssinian type church, a black church, and the other one was a gay radio station, or a gay mm -hmm. congregation center. So uh, a lot of the people because Luther just came up with the name straight, basically because it sounds like hate, and that's what the movie theater was. It was the hate, the hate right. theater that uh, we did that. So we were friends with the, the dad who just lived right up the street, and I was good friends with Rock and Danny. And so we had them re rehearse, rehearsing at the theater during the day. And Danny I'm, Rifkin. Yeah, Danny, still in touch with him, and started ripping out seats. Um, because we envisioned a big dance floor there and the 40-foot high screens and the entertainers sure. and the whole balcony with the light show. Sure, sure. And uh, so that's basically my friends uh, Hillel, who you've, you've talked to, and Bill, his brother, who is my actual partner. Uh, mm -hmm. We were the managers of the theater. Nobody Bill actually Lesner. owned the right. band. Yeah, Bill Lesnar. We tried to incorporate it for about two years and then ended up just, it was an unincorporated partnership is what it was, basically. And uh, we started chucking and jiving with no money. And Luther came up with a friend that, uh, from back east that was a plumbing uh, contractor and we got the money to build, uh, to buy the materials and people just started dropping in to help out. And it's amazing. Fantastic amazing. artists, we did tie-dyed uh, napkins that covered the lobby. Just incredible art. People uh, changed the whole building into psychedelic green and gold and vibrating. And we started uh, uh, there right away in the first month. We had a benefit down at the Avalon where I did lights for uh, Grateful Dead. Who, and she did Michael a benefit McCord. at the Avalon to raise yeah. money for the straight. For the straight. Right. That was right away. And then we got involved with Chet at that point because uh, he came to us in a very short period of time when he was doing Bo Diddley and wanted to borrow money. So um, this fellow from Buffalo, Jim Wilson, who was the one who was representing the money guy, became the DBA guy and started uh, wheeling and dealing uh, and gave Chet a thousand bucks, which he, on the weekend that he booked. Bo did it three cut. times in all over town, killed himself. And uh, so every weekend for thereafter, I had the pleasure of going to the Fillmore and getting the money back $50 at a time. Oh, gosh. That's how I got to know Bill Ham and, and hang out with, right. with Chip quite a bit. So it was real serendipitous. If, yeah, I'd love to, uh, 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 I, this is a wish longer piece, but I want to capture some stuff and make sure we don't, we don't leave out. Um, what are... In, in, when the when the Straight Theater opened, between the time it opened and closed, give me a few of your great memories of something of things that happened there. Okay, Artists sure. that the played Grateful there. Dead were there in and out. They were there at our christening. They played uh, the opening of the theater. They uh, came in for them in their own history. We had them, that was the last time they ever played in public as the original Grateful Dead. And then when they came back in, in six weeks, 
that was the first time they had the two drummers. And right. so uh, we had the last of the old dead and the first of the new dead. Super. And Janice would, would come by all the time. I'd known Pete since uh, Our boy college. Friend. No, the bass player oh, okay. in uh, Big Brother. <laughs> yes. And she felt quite at home there. She'd come and sit on the couch and and uh, nurse her bottle of Southern Comfort and just right. spend hours. Hanging out. And hanging out. And then right. she'd move on down the street and hang out with somebody else. But one night when she was singing in, in for a benefit for us, a rent party or something, they never took money from us. They just played and, and let us keep the money. You know? yes. but, but uh it was like the uh, she was whispering from the stage and you could hear all the way in the back and it was like the angels came down around her and coalesced. And it wasn't just the light show. There were some truly magic moments that oh, went totally. on there. Totally. When the uh, Native, uh, the Native Americans came and did oh, their I Bay Area it. thing there, they really helped cleanse the theater out from the equinox of the gods, which Kenneth Anger had rented the theater uh, a week before. But at the end of that week, they came and did a big powwow. So they came the after Kenneth Anger. So they after he did his ritual yeah, or whatever, they did they this big drum thing, it. and the roof of the it seemed Beautiful. like the ceiling went off, and the hall took off like a UFO. Right. <laughs> that was one of the one of the best moments in there. Steve Gaskin and his Monday night class was one of the. Uh, oh, he's not in that chronology. How did I leave him off? Good, well, we can every keep Monday, <laughs> Every Monday, he did the Monday night class in the skate theater and sitting on the floor before he moved out to Land's End. So that was always... We, uh, the what, kind of class, did they, what kind of class did he give? I mean, it was, was called it? the Monday night class. Okay. And it was basically, he didn't want to do it on Sunday because it would be too much like he was the preacher and right. they were the church. But right. basically, it was uh, New Age preaching. And there was a dance school as well. No, my, my that was wife, your permit, right, yes. Yeah. And, and your wife's that, name that is Caitlin Huggins, and she and Annette Rice uh, start started uh, a modern dance school there, because the dance school was a dance school. It was we had uh, the fellow that I mentioned previously from Buffalo, the, the poet who ended up being uh, the president of Straight Theater Enterprises, found that that the Masonic Hall next door would serve great purposes for offices and sure. that sort of thing. And then we had, he that had was actors, down the street towards the park. Was um, attached to the building uh, to and the it west. Became it became later the I-Beam. It was later the I-Beam. Okay. But it had large studios and so Caitlin came and you know, started the dance school. And then when the city, a year later when we opened the theater on the corner, the theater, uh, the city wouldn't give us a dance permit past the health inspection, all the inspections, but we couldn't dance because it was bad for the neighborhood. Right. And so we said, uh, well, look, we're a dance school. We're not a dance hall. Right. And that stopped. And it worked. It's <laughs> semantics. It's we got a lot, story. a lot of information about the dance school from some of the other, from Luther Green and... Uh, and well, he uh, has Ann Halpern's point of view, that's too, right. <laughs> and her whole kinetic thing. But she was there quite a bit, and it was making a, a, a big story about um, dance is powerful. If this video is watched, you know, tomorrow, 50 years from now, or 100 years from now, this is archived in the library. It's for not-for-profit. It is for the, our children's children's children. And they punch in Reginald Eugene Williams, Reggie. Um, there, I sense a feeling you had in this period. I sense a passion about what you were doing. And I have found from doing many of these interviews, as well as being there myself, that there, it almost was a calling, a passion. People became a family. They, well, things coalesced and you had to take sides. Even the HIP independent proprietors, HIP, or the Merchants Association, and sure. they had to coalesce because the other Merchants Association wouldn't let them in. Exactly. And they were, even though they were falling down and deteriorating, they still didn't want new blood in there. So it was always that exactly. give and take, it's a synthesis, antithesis. What, what kept you going? And do you still have some of that in you now? And Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm still in show business. I'm in the IATSC for 30 years, make movies and sure. produce and manage. Do you have any dreams for shows. the future? Oh, yeah. I have my light show that I continue to build. I want to 
uh, and it has meaning, uh, and I know what I'm doing now. Uh, when I was filming back then, I had no idea right. what an aperture was or what it really did or how lights, and now I'm pretty much no lighting by Kelvin. And, so your equipment is second nature. And well, I don't have any good equipment, but I know how to use other people's really good equipment. Right. <laughs> I know what you're supposed to do. If a young person was watching this 50 years from now, how can you inspire them? considering what you've been through, what you're doing now, and you're still going. Well, I think that uh, that's a good opportunity here to say that the whole story, like I said earlier, was usurped by Madison Avenue. The parts they could sell, the rest they denigrated and made the bad guys. So now the anti-war protesters are the bad guys, and the warmongers and the, the Marines are the good guys. And so this is... It is what people can do for themselves is believe in what they're doing regardless of what's out there. And I, I see it was the dawning of the age of Aquarius, if you want to be silly about it. Sure. And basically the whole thing hasn't happened yet, but it's turned into little kernels all over the world. Every little That's town right. you go through, Oroville or sure. has their, their even uh, Tucson, Arizona is the Fourth Avenue. And basically, there's the seed is spread all over sure. the world, but, it but it's still here. not understood. It and the intellectual part of it, uh, if you all the jokes, the snide remarks about if you could remember it, you weren't there. Basically, means you've got a mind that's rotted. I don't think so. so I was a historian. I held on to pieces, but I still have a, a strong uh, oral tradition sure. and, and think that people should talk about it. And, and, and share it. Eventually, yeah, it's, it's a great story to be told. It's, to me, it's like the 13th century uh, Genoa or some place sure. where the Renaissance happened. Sure. I totally relate. The poster art, the it's oh, a great card. Oh, my stuff. friends, yeah, I'm going to have to show you those. Yeah, I would look forward to seeing it. Um, I would like to know if I had a net that I could throw you and you could capture your favorite moment, what stands out in your mind? I know you have many, but grab one. Yeah, it's not, I could say, oh well. I can't say the human being without uh, getting my wife upset, so it must be... I'll the, give you two, okay. It quick. must be being married in the straight theater by Bishop Skillman. I had a wow. big wedding in the theater and, and pictures and all from that. Mm -hmm. Basically, a lot of the films I took uh, revitalized the... Uh, my images of certain things, so maybe I prefer them more than the ones I can't remember as clearly. But, uh, the Human Bn was a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the day they made acid illegal, Alan may have wanted to call it the love pageant, but it didn't. It had more to do with it. You can make it legal, but now you're going to have to do something about it. That's right. Basically, they did was change people's minds about it. Now it's a dangerous drug. Their minds are dangerous. The, I think that people have to filter and believe in what they believe in by research on your own and you don't just get fed dogma by um, politically paid journalists. Right. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being Thanks. here. You have not seen The Last of Us and I know we haven't seen The Last of You, but the 60s and Heat Ashbury is a giant puzzle with lots of pieces and you have a big part of it. So we want to thank you so much well, thank you. For, for being here. And I know you have a whole lot more stuff you would like to show us. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go film some of this in a few moments. Okay. Thank you.